we have here a record. We're going to place it on a record player. While we place it on the record player, it's going to go from 0 RPM and eventually speed up to its final speed of 45 RPM. And the time this is going to take is going to be 10 seconds. What we want to know is how many revolutions this record undergoes while it is spinning up from 0 to 45 RPM. So one thing that we can do is we can treat this very similar to one-dimensional kinematics. We can draw graphs of alpha versus time, graphs of omega versus time, graphs of theta versus time. In our case, right, we do have a change in omega, so we can write our final and initial, initial and final, 0 and 45, and we just have a nice constant acceleration. So for this, we can then write this as a constant acceleration, and then this would give us a parabolic relationship. So in our organized step, we can write the circular kinematic equations so equation one is omega f equals omega i plus alpha t. And we can kind of use, write Greek letters for all of the Greek characters we're using. So theta f equals theta i plus omega i times t plus one half alpha t squared. And just like we had with one dimensional kinematics, we can compile a table of knowns and unknowns. So we know that our omega i is 0 RPM. We know omega f is 45 RPM, but we should probably do a conversion. Because revolutions per minute is not a SI unit, we want to convert the minutes to seconds. So we can write 1 minute divided by 60 seconds. And then when we talk about revolutions, revolutions is not an SI unit. We want radians. And then we want revolutions on the bottom. So for every one revolution, we have two pi radians. So doing this cancellation outright, we divide it such that the minutes should cancel out, the revolutions should cancel out. And so we have 45 times 2 pi is 90 pi, divided by 60. 9 divided by 60 is 3 halves. So we can say that our omega final is 3 over 2 pi radians per second. We don't even have to spell it the full seconds. So then we are going to then find out what alpha is. We know the time is 10 seconds. We know our initial position is 0 radians. And we want to find our final position. So if we look at equation 2, we don't know theta f and we don't know alpha, so we don't have enough to solve here. But if we look up at equation 1, we know omega f is 3 pi over 2. We know omega i is 0. We don't know alpha just yet, but we know time is 10 seconds. So we can solve for alpha, which should be 3 pi over 20 radians per second. Once we have that, then we can use that to find our equation 2. So now we have theta f equals 0, so don't need to write it. Omega i, 0, so don't need to write it. And then we have 1 half times alpha, which is 3 pi, 3 pi over 20 times time squared, which is 10 seconds quantity squared. So. Just quickly before we cancel anything out, 3 times 10 times 10 is 300 pi. 20 times 2 is 40. So 300 pi divided by 40. We can do right 0 and 0, and 3 divided by 4 is 7.5. So we get 7.5 pi radians. Now, if we choose instead, we can then find it in our revolutions, which is probably a little bit better. So then we again have... 7.5 pi radians times one revolution divided by 2 pi radians. So we can get another cancellation of the radians and radians. 
And then we're dividing by two pi, which is why we kept this two pi all the way over. 7.5 divided by two is 3.75. So we have 3.75 revolutions. And that's how many revolutions it takes as it accelerates from zero to 45 over 10 seconds. So the big thing with circular kinematic problems is they're exactly the same as regular kinematics problems, just with a couple Greek letters. So in fact, they're usually a lot easier because we are accounting for them being scary. Once you can get over the scary omegas, thetas, and alphas, then these turn out to be problems we've already solved and have a lot of experience with.